How's it going, everyone? You know, I was wondering the other day, what would television be like and movies without a camera? And what would cars be like if we didn't have wheels? And where would smartphones be if we didn't have electricity? And what the heck are all these random questions? Today we're going to be talking about the most important, influential, mo would not be where we are now, cubes that have come out. I think it's important to look at the uh, insane development of cubing hardware over the past 10 years and even before that. So to start us off, I couldn't talk about the most important cubes without mentioning the original Rubik's 3x3, duh. When it comes to the Rubik's 3x3, what's there to say? It was the first 3x3 and without it, Speed cubing would obviously not exist. Jumping ahead 30 plus years, we got the Diane Zanchi, which in my opinion was the beginning of modern, modern speed cubing. Sure, the Diane had other cubes like the Gu Hong before then, but I think the Zanchi was when Diane really got their start. It was the first cube to include torpedoes on the edges. Yeah, these things. Hard to believe cubes used to not have those. The Zanchi was one of the most important speed cubes of the 2010s. It introduced a more modern design and features that are still seen in cubes today. And then the Panchi happened. Yeah, okay. Moving on, we have what might be the best 3x3 design of all time if magnets aren't taken into account. You already saw it. It's the Volk 3, duh. The Volk 3 was released in 2016, was not only insanely popular that year, but magnetic versions are still being used by top solvers to this day. It's hard to believe that the Volk 3 has lasted as long as it has when most 3x3s lose relevance af after about a year. Now I could sit here and gush about this cube for all day, but that's for another video, so I'll briefly summarize. It's a simple but great design that's still relevant, low gimmicks, high performance. Now I also want to talk about some more recent releases that I think are worthy of being on this list. The Moyu Weilong GTS-3M was a successor to the popular Moyu Weilong GTS-2M. Moyu did something different here. They added ridges to the outside of the pieces. Uh, okay. To be fair, the ridges weren't bad, but like, why? Of course, that's not why this cube is in the video. It's because of this. The GTS-3M was the first cube to have a spring compression system that could be used just by turning a dial. It's the equivalent of swapping springs or GS, GS nuts on a GAN cube, but way faster. The GAN 356X was a pretty cool cube because it was the first cube that you could swap out the magnets in by just changing the magnets in the edges. And it was overpriced, but it was very good. And I would be lying if I didn't mention it because magnet adjustment has become a big trend nowadays. I'd also be lying if I said the GAN X's magnet system was even close to the Guoguan Yixiao EDM system. The EDM wasn't a great cube, but it made adjusting magnet strength even better by allowing you to do it with just your finger. No extra magnets required. Yeah, I can see why Gan would want to steal that. Now that I've covered what I think are the most important 3x3s, I'm going to talk about some game-changing cubes for other events. And let me tell you, these are some serious game changers. I think, yeah, you already know what I'm talking about. Hey look, it's the cheese square one. Nobody saw that one coming. Before the Chi Square One's release, the Square One event had a very small following and was notorious for having bad hardware. The Chi Square One was the first good Square One. It had flaws, most notably this, but it was still good enough to revolutionize the event and get lots of people into it. And here's another one nobody thought would be on the list, the Haze 7. Like the Chi Square One, the Haze 7 revolutionized the 7x7 event but it did so in a sort of a different way than the Chi Square One. The Chi Square One got more people into the event. I feel like the Hey 7 didn't get as many new people into the event, and this was probably because of the $60 price tag, also because the people who do 7x7 were already doing 7x7. But what the Hey 7 did was lower the times by insane amounts, especially the world records. Like, seriously, if somebody was to stop cubing in 2017 and come back in 2019, they'd be like, what the heck happened to all the 7x7 world records? To conclude, I'm gonna briefly talk about a puzzle, or rather two puzzles, that I think could revolutionize an event, but we just don't know yet. So, obviously I'm talking about the Shangshao clock and the Qi clock, both recently released. 
So the Shang Shao clock wasn't amazing, but it was a great accessible budget option that did not exist in the clock market before. And the Qi clock is probably the best clock on the market. So I think these two combined together, the flagship clock and the budget clock that's more accessible to beginners could revolutionize the clock event, but we haven't had enough competitions since their release date to know whether it really is going to revolutionize the event, but I think they have a chance. So those are all the cubes that I think had a big impact on cubing. So at the beginning of the video, I asked some kind of random questions like, what would cars be like without wheels? What would smartphones be like without electricity? And what would uh, movies be like if we didn't have a camera? And if I added a more cubing related question in that same vein, it would be, what would the cubing market be without magnets? So the first three, it's pretty obvious. Movies wouldn't exist. Smartphones wouldn't exist. Cars wouldn't exist. But the fourth one, I mean, we still got the Valk 3, 